Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 11th meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2015. Can I remind all those present to ensure that they have all electronic devices switched off, because they can interfere with the sound system. Um, item one, um, first item, is to uh, decide whether to take item four on the ongoing financial scrutiny and item five on the educational attainment gap in private. Uh, are members agreed? Agreed to that, thank you. Um, our next item is to take evidence on our inquiry into attainment of school pupils with a sensory impairment. This is our first evidence session on the inquiry, and I thank all those who have made a written or a BSL submission. Uh, the first panel of witnesses will cover issues relating to the attainment of pupils with a visual impairment, and the second panel will cover those with a hearing impairment. Uh, there may obviously be some crossover between the two panels. Next week, we'll take evidence from some service providers and then from the Scottish Government the following week. Uh, also on Monday, we will visit Craigie High School in Dundee to meet pupils and parents and to discuss the support that's provided by the school to pupils with sensory impairments. So I know committee members are looking forward to that uh, particular visit. Can I welcome this morning um, our first panel, um, Dominic Everett, uh, who's from the Royal National Institute of Blind People, Dr John Ravenscroft from the Scottish Sensory Centre, Sally Peters Patterson, I should say, sorry, uh, is from the Scottish Association for Visual Impairment Education, and Tracy Christie from Hazelwood School Parent Council. Uh, welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, I'm going to go straight to questions. Um, uh, and the first question is from uh, Mary Scanlon. Mary. Thank you. Um, I, th I think the first thing we need to do is to look at the extent of the issue. And uh, I'm certainly very concerned about the, the data that we have before us this morning. Um, if I can just give you a figure. In 2012, there were 869 children on the blind and partially sighted register. The total number is estimated to be 2,080. And this figure is likely to be an underestimate with another 800. So within two sentences, we go from <coughs> excuse me, 869 to 2,880. Why haven't we got uh, more accurate figures? And in asking that, uh, oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just ask that just now. Why aren't the figures more accurate? OK, I, I'll, I'll start with that one, I think, if I may. Um, I think it's how you initially define um, a child with visual impairment and who is actually acknowledging that the child is visually impaired themselves. So currently on the registration system, you can only get certified uh, if by an ophthalmologist has deemed that you are in fact actually visually impaired. Now, if you use a whole range of um, education uh, uh, pupil census data and other registers, there's no guarantee that the pupils who are on the pupil census are actually visually impaired, and so that may account for an overestimate. If you look at the incidents and if you look at the... Uh, I can't say the word clearly... Uh, prevalence rates, um, you're looking at around 2 per thousand, 20 per 10,000. So a figure we believe in Scotland is around the 2,000 mark. 2,200 is actually the figure that we, uh, uh, academics working in the field, believe to be the actual number in Scotland. But again, because the way that people census works, there is that overestimation as well. And so the data from Education Scotland varies within that. Can I, from RNIB Scotland. Can I also add that um, RNIB Scotland are quite concerned about the fact that so many children um, have a hidden sight loss, particularly if they have complex needs, um, certain conditions, you know, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, multiple sclerosis. Many of those children who suffer from those types of conditions have an undetected sight loss, which can also perhaps explain why there are so many um, variances in the different types of, of information that's provided. There's a lack of data, and, and that data actually needs to be collected much more effectively than it actually has in the past. Education Scotland have very different figures from those 2,080 that you've given there as well, um, and I think there's a real need to actually get right down and, and investigate to find out who those children are that are out there and the type of, of supports that they need. I'm grateful for your uh, responses because really my next question is how does the lack of data between 800, 2200 or 2800, how does the lack of data impact on, if I may say, the lack of services? If you haven't got the data, how can you possibly uh, meet the demand and support for, for children and adults? 
Undoubtedly. Um, and uh, if you've read the reports that have been submitted, um, it's quite interesting to see the overlap between three separate organisations. And, and I'm quite sure Tracy's submission as well, with regard to the fact that you know, right across Scotland, the services have been delivered in very, very different ways. It's extremely fragmented. Our concern from RNIB Scotland is that um, because there's a lack of data, we don't know who the children are. We don't know about their, their individual eye conditions, which can affect how they learn, how they can access the curriculum and and indeed engage with the wider world around them as well. Our fear is that local authorities, as a consequence of not having that data, are basically just saying, well, we don't actually need to provide the, the depth or intensity of support that you, as professionals, say that is needed. Um, so we need the data first so that we can then target local authorities and make them stand up to meet their statutory obligations. We need the data. We don't have the data. What action needs to be taken to improve the data collection and assessment of sensory, sensory impairment. What needs to be done, it's not being done at the moment. Well, I think if you, um, uh, I think in certainly now submission, a submission from uh, VINSIP, if you look at the pathway that comes in uh, f from there, I think if we can have a formalized pathway for every child that gets registered through the VINSIP network, which developed from the VI Scotland network, which all of us were involved in, uh, that would be one way of how to collect the actual data there. I mean, I think Dominic's absolutely right. If you don't know, A, how many children there are and the profile of the visually impairment themselves, whether it's due to eye condition or whether it's due to uh, a condition of the a damage to the brain, then how can you support and get the resources necessary in order to do that. And I think we need to be have formalised systems, either through the Vincent Network, to ensure that this data, whether it's I, the profile of visually impaired children, is actually being captured. Otherwise, we are, in some ways, and some local authorities, guessing in the dark of how much, res how much support and how much resources we need. Thank you. It's very helpful. I'll just move on to attainment and I hope the two ladies will come in this time. Um, <coughs> Before you move on, sorry, sorry. Um, did you have a very small supplementary? That I was interested in the, in the exchanges on the back of Mary's questions. I mean, are there examples of where, for example, parents are, are making a, a case that, that their child needs additional support because of a visual impairment and are not getting it? I mean, are we meeting a degree of resistance, or is it more a question that the data is not there and therefore it kind of allows local authorities off the hook in terms of what they have to deliver? I mean, I think as a teacher, I mean, I've worked in mainstream for the last, um, as a VI teacher in the last nine years. Um, if you look purely at registration, there are some parents that actually don't want their child registered as blind. Now, that is another whole kind of, can of worms. Now, I know that they have... You know, they know that their child has a visual condition, they know that they need support and that they are getting that support to, you know, whatever level they need it within school. But in terms of actually recording that as this child being registered blind or partially sighted, there's also a debate about whether or not you, you should register children because visual impairments, some of them are very fixed, but some of them, a lot of the children I work with, can be more fluid than that. Um, and also in terms of parents... Um, it, it's very difficult, though, without, I suppose, kind of, let's say, tying everyone with the same brush, a lot of the children that we work with are with families where sort of self-advocacy skills are not, not the best, and that, that isn't their fault at all, but that in the terms of their child goes to school and their school, you know, is providing a certain level of support and they're learning and they're achieving, they may not be doing as much as we want them to do within the resources that we can provide, but... We don't have a huge number of parents that, that would complain, if you like, that, that that isn't being met, unless there is a very specific um, need that is, not, that is not being met. So, and we are in a difficult position as, as teachers in that we are not allowed to sort of influence that, that parent. It, does, does that, I'm trying to be politically <laughs> correct on this one, but, but there is a, there's a real problem with that. So there are children very much that we will look at and go, services should be better for that child. But if we are tied by how many staff we have and how many children we support and how often we can go and see that child, then, then without a parent actually physically complaining about a situation, I think it'd be all right. then, then it sometimes it's very difficult for that picture to be any different. Is that Part of, part of my role as education and family services manager is to advocate for those parents. 
If you look at RNIB submission, we emphasise the lack of early intervention support. We're not getting families right from the start of their journey. So parents are, um, they don't know and understand their own child's sight loss. They don't know how they can support it, how they could scaffold the child's learning at home and their understanding of the world around them, never mind how to, to support the work that's being done within school. So many parents don't know how they can help their child. As a consequence of that, they actually don't know the right questions to ask of education professionals and other agencies as well. Um, so that's why it's so important to start thinking about getting our families right at the very, very beginning to inform them as much as possible so they know if their child is not receiving appropriate support. As Sally mentioned, she's absolutely right. As, I, mean, I was a teacher of the Vision Pair for 20 years before I joined RNIB four years ago. I saw parents who whose child was not being supported by the local authority. And the local authority are restricted because of the amount of funds that they have, etc. Teachers can't challenge the local authority. Um, whereas I see that as part of my role, is to ensure that local authorities are made to actually in, uh, provide what, what should be being delivered to a child as and when required. Could I um, explain something? If my experience as a parent... I have a nine-year-old who's registered blind, a pupil at Hazelwood School since the age of three, which, when she entered the nursery. It was a fight, frankly, to um, obtain a place in the nursery for my daughter. Hazelwood School is based in Glasgow. It's a Glasgow Authority school. It was built and partly funded by Scottish Government directly, as well as Glasgow City Council. As an out-of-authority parent, my director of education in Easton Bartonshire was unwilling to meet the cost of her education. Um, we didn't end up going as far as a tribunal because we were able to make a very, very strong case. And ultimately, we had our daughter's um, educational needs met and she has now been in school for seven years. Prior to that, the only... The most valuable input we had was from Dominic's predecessor at RNIB, who was a qualified teacher of the blind and the family officer, and she was able to come to our home almost on a bi-weekly basis and help us understand what had happened to our daughter and what her likely future educational needs were going to be. Now, that first year when my daughter... Um, lost her vision. I opened the newspaper on one August day. There was a double spread in the Herald announcing the opening of a school for the sensory impaired from Glasgow, in Glasgow. And I said to myself, hallelujah. Um, over, this, over the subsequent seven years, that hallelujah has diminished and has gone because the service level has diminished at the school. But I know we're going to come on to that a bit later. So that's how hard it is to get your child into a school. Yeah, th thank you for that. Um, thank you, Liam McArthur, for this question. Uh, I'll, I'll, check, I'll come to you first before we go back to Mary on the attainment stuff. Check. Uh, check. Thank you. In fact, Mary's asked most of the questions I, I wish to ask. But just, just, just coming back to the definition of those that are sensory impaired, the sight, um, who actually defines that? We talked about ophthalmologists, and is that not whoever should, def in the medical profession presumably, define that? Why is that information not captured there, and what is the connectivity between those that define the, the impairment and those that then have to educate, and I include parents in that? I mean, where is the connectivity between that? I, I know that some parents will not engage, as you've said, but where, why are we not capturing this data at source. If you have a child like mine, it's absolutely easy and apparent to notice that that child cannot see. But there are various profiles of um, CVI, children and young people in the country, who have, because of the particular kind of brain damage they have, their sight loss presents in different ways. And I would say that even as a parent, it takes you years and years. I'm still learning about my daughter's sight loss because even though she's registered blind, her sight is changing all the time as she grows and her brain develops. So what you actually need to do with young people is be reassessing their visual acuity. But who's going to do that? Who, who should be... I mean, the, the issue Ophthalmologists. is... We have to be... Right. So if we say that's the case, then they... you know. Presumably, there are mm -hmm. ongoing assessments 
Uh, but at well, source, then we, because, like Mary Scanlon said, we're all over the place with numbers. And how can we determine assessment need, uh, train, educational assessment needs, unless we know exactly what the foundation is of, of what we require going forward? Well, the, the, no, I, I feel, and you'll correct me, I'll stand corrected by the professionals here, but the cohort of professionals who understand vision and vision loss is minuscule. So, what do you mean by minuscule? Because a lot of the teachers in the profession don't seem to understand the individual vision loss of the child. So we are reliant often on health professionals to, to analyse and assess and tell us the nature of our children's um, vision and how education can best be um, put in front of them that they can access. So actually, for me personally, the most useful route to understanding my, children, my child's vision loss has been through ophthalmo the, op the consultant ophthalmologist. Can I add to that as well? You, you've got to understand there's a difference between a clinical assessment of vision and a functional vision assessment. A functional vision assessment is carried out usually on a regular basis by a, a qualified teacher of the visual impaired. There is, a, there is an issue across Scotland. Um, there has, there's a, I don't know if you've heard of the C Vista model, which is basically a joint functional assessment service uh, based in Tayside. And that's the gold standard of multi professional approach to carrying out functional vision assessments, bringing uh, education, health, social service practitioners together in the best interests of a child. In a sense, the true spirit of GERFEC in action. That doesn't happen across Scotland. Um, and as, as I say, it's, it's almost like a one off. There are some C Vista lights. Um, Money, money and time. Um, it's it's time heavy. Um, it takes a lot of you know in terms of resources for local authorities to to backfill if a teacher is going to a functional vision assessment clinic. Likewise, I'm quite sure for for health and social service providers too. And Tracy's right. You know, an ophthalmologist will will carry out a, a clinical assessment, determine what it is a child can or cannot see. But what a child can see in an eye clinic is very different from what they can see in their home or within school. Um, and how they engage with, with, the, with the classroom environment or out in the playground and things like that as well. That's the role of the teacher, the visual impaired, that on a regular basis they're engaging with the class teacher, who's not a VI specialist, and ensuring that they feel supported in helping that child access the curriculum. 70% of children within Scotland attend their local school uh, under you know, presumption of mainstreaming. So we, we have to ensure that there's better collaboration between professionals, that functional vision assessments have been carried out, that parents are part of that process so that they know and understand what the child can see, so that they can reinforce what's been delivered within a curricular setting. And also to ensure that um, the parent and the child, as they get older, are part of the decision-making process as well, so that they are taking possession of their own learning and are being prepared effectively to access the school curriculum, but also for independent adulthood too. We're making un unemployable young people at the moment. Um, that's why the, the level of, of unemployment amongst blind and partial society people is so high. That's because we're not preparing them for successful life. Our children are surviving when they leave school. Surviving in school, many of them. They're certainly not thriving. And that's really what we have to be doing to try and ensure that we are providing better service in the future. We're, we're not working at the moment. It's not effective. Yeah, like so, as a, like to say, as a teacher... Um, I, best case scenario is I, I get a letter in from an ophthalmologist and because I was one of the members of staff that had to do what we called a new referral report, then I would get um, a letter would come into the service that would tell me about this child. Now, usually, maybe not before they were two or three, and I would get a, a letter in. I would then arrange to go and see that parent. I would do a home visit. I would do, as Dominic was mentioning, I wouldn't be doing a clinical assessment, I would be doing a functional assessment of their vision. What can they see when they're at home? What can they see when they're at nursery? What adaptations do we need to put in place to support that child? And then that child would be given a level of support. That may be a monthly visit, it may be a termly visit, a yearly visit, whichever. Or they may not actually come into our remit for support at all. So that, that's what you're looking at. But equally, I probably have lost count of the number of children that I have been phoned by a school and said, we're a bit concerned because this child doesn't seem to be able to access the books that they're reading, whatever. And a child at, at one stage in primary six, 10, 11 years old, who had a visual impairment, who for lots of reasons had not made it to hospital appointments, 
and then had been very clever at making sure that she sat nearest to the board, that she sat next to a friend, so that she could copy what they wrote. And all of a sudden, in primary six, I'm doing a functional vision assessment. I am contacting hospitals, trying to find out. And for a child that then actually needed um, you know, a place at, a, at a, a school other than her, her local school. So, unfortunately, it just isn't simple. This is a child that should have been you know, when she was two years old, should have been on some sort of register that said, yes, she has a significant visual impairment. Um, and for lots of reasons, she has slipped through the net, but she does become a number. But she isn't a number right now because she's been coping, if that makes any... Thank you. I'm going to um, come back to Mary Scanlon and then Gordon. Um, it, it, uh, thank you very much, and in particular, Tracy, there's no one who is better than the, the parent uh, at the chalk face, if you like. Uh, I'll just put my points together, uh, I, I realise colleagues want to come in. Uh, first of all, um, the data on attainment for pupils in England, Wales and Northern Ireland is analysed in such a way, Dominic, to address your point, uh, that it's separated, the information is gathered separately for pupils with a visual impairment only and those with a visual impairment and other disability. Um, in Scotland, uh, it's not possible to separate these two figures. So that's my first point, uh, if it can be done elsewhere and perhaps you, you wish to uh, uh, say something about that. But the second issue, um, Sally, I'm, I'm quite familiar with the Care Inspectorate reports at nursery education, which I'm very, very impressed with. And I do understand that every child entering nursery does a form of assessment, if you like, into their needs. And you have to report on how they've advanced during the years. Why is that not picking up visual impairment? And my third point uh, is secondary schools. We only gather data on pupils that stay on uh, beyond school uh, S4 and uh, on leaving school. So obviously something has to be done there. And just my final point, I'm sorry to throw it all at you, but uh, the figures on um, positive destinations uh, I thought was interesting. These are all from our SPICE report here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Positive destinations for... Uh, pupils with no ASN is 91.7. For those with a visual impairment, it's 85.3. Now, I hope you'll forgive me, but I expected it to be much less. But that comes down to the definition of a positive destination. I appreciate that. And as an ex-FE lecturer, with no ASN, 22%, uh, 22 half went into further education. And with a visual impairment... 42. Um, I, I hope you'll forgive me, but I actually expected the figures to be much worse. I'm pleased that they are where they are. But perhaps uh, I would just like your analysis of these figures. Are things not as bad as, as, as we think they are? Are these figures just a result of the scant, minimal data collection that we have? And if it can be done in England, Wales and Northern Ireland... Your point, Dominic, about the hidden uh, sight laws. Why can't it be done in Scotland? And that's my. Uh, well, I'm, I'm glad that's that. That's you, Mary, because that's that's plenty. <laughs> if you could try and wrap those those questions together, if you don't mind, because we've got a lot of members who want to come in. Uh, Dominic, do you want to start? I'm happy to go. Um, a number of things there. Um, with regards to the gathering of evidence, you're right. Why can't we split and, and find out exactly which children have got additional support needs as well as a visual impairment and those that are VI only? Um, I think part of the problem was, if I go back to 2012, um, when the Scottish Census Centre carried out research into the numbers of children across Scotland, the number of teachers, etc., working within the field of visual impairment, not all the local authorities responded to that research. Now, there was no obligation for them to respond. So some of the, the key hitters, like Glasgow and Edinburgh, didn't respond. Where there are quite sizable populations of children who live with sight loss there. Um, I found that particularly frustrating because I was part of the group who was, was gathering that evidence. Um, and I felt as though if it had been forced upon them to respond, they would have got a much clearer understanding of the data being carried out, uh, so the research being carried out. With regards also to um, the, the, the employment and the positive destinations, my experience is that a lot of young visual impaired people, as they leave school, are going on to further education college and are being planted in courses that are 
inaccessible. There's a, a poor transition from school to the college. So therefore, I then get a phone call from the college to say, we've well, got a blind child here, what do we do? And how do we support that young person? It's a very difficult transition period for them in the short term. Um, and in the long term, many of them tread water for three or four years um, and you know do one short course to the next um, and are not necessarily being supported appropriately there. And then that leads to the 70% of blind and past society people who are unemployed. That's the true statistic. RNIB carried it recently, uh, research recently um, across the UK, and it's something like 69 point something percent of blind and passive sighted adults of working age are unemployed. So there's a, there's a feeling, there's a feeling in the transition from school to college and university, yeah. that's a weakness. There's a feeling within the college and university sector to a certain extent, maybe not quite so bad as it used to be, where the young people are, are moving around on short term courses, and then at the other end, they're then facing unemployment because they don't have the skills. I think one of the, the, the major issues, Mary, is that a lot of our kids are leaving school with reasonable qualifications, but they're still unemployable, unemployable because they don't have the interpersonal skills, the softer skills, the mobility, the, the, the independent living and travel skills that will enable them to actually engage more effectively within the workplace. That is a major feeling within the curriculum that we have at the moment. And I'm hoping we get a chance to come in onto that later on about the, what we need to deliver more effectively to ensure that our young people are actually truly ready for work. I think um, to answer your first question, I, I, there's absolutely no need reason why we can't do it. Um, the Viz Scotland database, which I was looking at before I was coming here, which has over 1,150 children on it, um, has 70% children have additional disabilities, 30% have single disabilities. So the database that I collected and have already has that uh, system, but it's not a mandatory requirement to go on it. But if there was, we would be able to know a lot more and put those resources in place. And Dominic is absolutely right in terms of the positive destination. Uh, it's how you define it. I totally agree with that. But we know from all the research that um, it's not necessarily the visual impairment per se that prevents the employment. It's the other thing. It's the mobility. It's the daily living. It's, that, it's those skills. And it's those that aren't really being catered for. And I know we'll go into that a little bit more. Uh, so um, although it's great to hear that you've got these figures of 85%, the real figure that 70% of uh, people with visual impairment aren't getting employment, I think is the one we need to really focus on. I think that's, yeah. that's the one. I don't know, Sally or... or it's just the nursery education container that it should be picked up yeah. there. Just, is there any additional points you want to make? Because I'm, I'm conscious of time and there's a number of things we want to do. Yeah, at this Kate juncture, Tracy, yeah. because we are talking about children with a visual impairment in mainstream. And I'd like to see now, I was very disappointed that this inquiry sought not to um, look for views from the multiple disability visual impairment community. So I should not really be here today. Why should you not be here? Because the parameters of this inquiry did not include children who are like my daughter who have multiple disabilities including a sensory impairment. Now I think it's a big big mistake to ignore this section um, of the sensory impaired young people in Scotland. Although they're maybe not going to the workplace they are equally deserving of a positive destination after school. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and more children have um, uh, MDVI than single disability VI. We, we know this from the data and the research that we have. So uh, it's absolutely, I think the first point I made is how do you define visual impairment? Uh, uh, and if you just define it as a single disability plus, then, then that's not the profile of visually impaired children we see in Scotland. What we see is around 30% single disability and then the rest... Are, have visual impairment with additional disabilities, the majority complex needs. Right. Um, as a consequence, we have children in Hazelwood School who not only have difficulty in accessing the curriculum, but they also have difficulty in accessing some of the issues that um, my colleagues here have brought up, such as habilitation and independence and life skills. Even though we have a building that on the face of it provides um, an environment where they can be taught these life schools, it's in a state of disrepair. The Life Skills House 
is closed down because it's full of mould and damp and it's inaccessible. It's not being brought back online because of cuts to the education budget in Glasgow. And since the opening of Hazelwood in 2007, not one child has slept a night away from home in the Life Skills House. So I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this up to make the point that those in the complex need sector are every bit as deserving you know, of a positive um, um, approach to independence and, and life skills in their education. Indeed, the, the committee recognised that, and that's why when we set the uh, agenda for this particular very short inquiry, which is a subset of a wider attainment inquiry, uh, we did recognise the multiple disabilities that some children have. And in fact, uh, we stated quite clearly that it, uh, uh, given the time available, we would, in this occasion, look at single disabilities, disability sensory impairment. However, as we go on to say, we po it may be possible to then go on and consider other issues relating to children with multiple, dis multiple disabilities separately. So it's not that we... Those white VIHI children in mainstream have more than one disability. And that's, so that's what we so said, multiple address it as a, as, a, as a united body. Well, as I say, we, we did recognise it. And we, we're not ignoring it. We did recognise it, and we stated quite clearly in the remit of the inquiry why we were taking the, the particular approach that we were. But I'm going to move on to uh, Gordon. Please, Gordon. Answered the nursery education. I do think oh, that's... Yeah. Yeah. Could, sure. could we very briefly yes. answer that then? Um, children, I know from my own um, experience as a parent, I mean, are, are screened in terms of very, very basically to, to flag up things. Um, my own daughter, that was why I ended up at the opticians when she was five. Okay, so that was picked up in a, in a screening issue. Um, certainly by the time you get to education, then I don't know that how many things a screening programme, it may well flag up things that nobody has yet discovered between the ages of, of naught and five. Quite often it is a teacher that, that comes to us on a, not a, we don't screen the whole of primary one. Um, maybe that is something that, that needs to be done. Maybe it's a, a visual impairment issue that, that you, you look at children in primary one. What we have to rely on is the fact that a teacher comes to us, bearing in mind that a teacher is with those children for six hours a day and notices that there is something different about the way that child accesses the curriculum and then they come to us and we get a phone call or we're in the school already and we get asked about another child in another class. I mean, there are processes you have to go through, but we have said that, that we've picked this up, and nine times out of ten it can be a class teacher who has noticed that there's something about the way that child accesses the curriculum. But equally, and I, I can't overstate this, it, it's such a, a fluid thing. You can have a child who, who I had one very recently in my last job, um, a child who had done, we'd done a neurofile report, she was going to be what we call a monitor visit, a once a year and within the space of 18 months, I had a phone call from the head teacher saying, we have a, you know, a problem, can you come in? And this child has gone from once a year to once a month because her vision is now deteriorating. So there, there are very much, you could say in primary one that there are two children in a school of 300, but that, that's the nature of it, which is why it's so critical that we have the staffing that we have in terms of visual impairment teachers to do that kind of assessment. Thank you for that. Um, Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, convener. Um, Dominic... You said earlier on that um, the children are not th thriving when they're leaving school. Um, what I'm keen to understand is what we need to do to focus, to change, to change this. And when I was reading through the evidence the other day there, I, I, I was a bit confused. I mean, most of the evidence that you have given focuses on the educational attainment gap. And you said educational attainment is linked to the preparation for independent adulthood, future employability, and economic resilience. However, um, Scottish Sensory Centre said it's led to some educators to focus too much on the educational attainment of children with visual impairment in order that they match their sighted peers. And the Royal Blind School says many uh, visually impaired children have access to a reasonable standard of curricular resources, but with little or no time devoted to life independent living skills academic achievement is of less value. So where should we be focusing? Should we be focusing on life skills or trying to close the attainment gap? Or but is it a bit of both? To my, to my, to my mind, hearing you reading those out, um, they all more or less sound to me as though they're saying the same. Right. The, the Curriculum for Excellence um, has wonderful aspirations. The four capacities are really setting a, a standard for what we expect Scottish children to have by the time they, they enter um, adult life. 
the problem with the curriculum at the moment is it's jam-packed and it's extremely busy. Now, if you think that for a, a, a child with full vision or no disability, it's a, it's a very busy day for them anyway. If you've got a blind or partially sighted child, or indeed, as Tracy mentioned, a child with significant other needs, ensuring that that child is, is prepared um, and is fully under un, engaged, let's say, um, and, and within the school life, um, and, and has the skills necessary to go on and be successful in life, as well as learn language and maths and lang uh, you know, foreign languages or history, etc. It's extremely challenging for the teaching professionals to ensure that that happens. There's a huge debate within the world of visual impairment about. Should we focus too much on academic? Should we ensure that the children perhaps can look at the academic side of things maybe slightly later um, and, and focus on the, the preparation of, you know, going back to early years. I mean, Sally was talking there about, you know, the, the, when they pick babies up. If you lost your sight tomorrow, you've got an understanding of the world around you. A blind child or a child with severe visual impairment needs to learn about the world around them, needs to be taught how to understand their own self in, in space, how they can engage with their living room, out into the wider house, into the community, and around the school or nursery when they start attending. All of that has to be taught. It just doesn't come automatically. They can't see and learn through, through that medium. Um, so time has to be dedicated to ensure that parents feel that they can support the child so that they can help the child. But more importantly, the nursery staff and the primary teaching staff and the secondary teaching staff know how they can support a child as well. My own personal view is I think there is an overemphasis on the academic side. Um, I think time has to be taken from the curriculum. Instead of a child leaving school with six or seven hires, I think we need to start focusing um, or shifting focus and ensuring that those young people can touch type by the time they leave primary school. That they know how to use appropriate assistive technology, whether that be iPads or Braille technology devices, so that they can be an independent learner. Time has to be put within the curriculum to ensure that there's orientation and mobility lessons being delivered as part of an appropriate habilitation service, delivered not by teachers, but by delivered by habilitation specialists who know and understand the developmental needs of children. Um, and I also think that employability skills, social skills, communication, all of that has to be delivered and taught to a young person. You know, um, social inclusion is a major problem for blind and past society kids. Sometimes they're very welcome within a primary setting and when they go up to high school, their friends that they had in primary school disappear like snow off a dike. And many of those children become very socially isolated because it's not cool for teenagers maybe to be hanging about with a blind child within a mainstream setting. And I have to, in a sense, in engage and support that young person through that huge emotional situation that they then have to endure. And that can then affect their behaviour within class, etc, etc. In a sense, what we are doing here today is we're really just scratching at the surface. There is There are major problems in, in, in what we're delivering to children across Scotland. And we have to think about the curriculum and what's within that curriculum. And we have to make sure that the professionals who are working with those children are geared up so that they can more effectively support those young people. As, I say, as, as I've said many times, it's not happening just now. Teachers are not qualified. Local authorities are trying to do things on the cheap and are not putting people through the, the appropriate qualifications, um, the postgraduate diploma. We've got teachers retiring and not being replaced. They've been replaced by inexperienced staff or perhaps not being ex uh, replaced at all. Up in Orkney, there were months, in fact years, where they didn't even have a teacher, the visual impaired. Um, we've got Argyll and Butte. We've got one woman works two days a week trying to cover the whole geographical area of Argyll and Butte. These things are happening right across Scotland, where local authorities, at a time of austerity, don't have the money and therefore are not meeting the needs of blind and partially sighted children. John. I, I think... Um, if only it was just as clear-cut as that, uh, Gordon, that you have this, well, it's entertainment or it's habilitation, I think, as Dominic has alluded to, it's a complex mix. And I think the complex mix uh, begins with well, let's have qualified teachers. That would be a good start. Let's have them recognised by the GTCS. That would also be a good start because the GTCS actually doesn't recognise uh, my colleagues on my left and my right as, as teachers of the visually impaired. They recognised as additional support uh, workers, but not as teachers of the VI. I think that would be a, a, a good start. And let's have more qualified teachers of the VI. I think that would be uh, a, 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 certainly a good start. Also, I think then... Curriculum for Excellence is a great revelation to have in Scotland, and it really affords the opportunity to develop 
uh, across all of the curricula, uh, the whole bit, the hub skills, uh, the mobility within the Curriculum for Excellence framework. I, I think more than anywhere else, the Curriculum for Excellence really affords this to occur. But for, for it to happen and for it to occur, we again need trained specialists, not specialist teachers of the VI, but specialist habilitation workers uh, who work primarily with children. And this doesn't need to happen just within the school, and this is where a lot of the failings occur. It needs to happen at home, on the way to school, and within the summer holidays as well, because what happens at the moment is the child may be able to have some mobility around the school, but then the summer holidays, eight weeks, six weeks summer holidays, the child doesn't have that training, doesn't have the resources within the home environment, and that has an effect of, uh, as well. So I think, um, I mean, I won't go on for long, which I could do, uh, it's a, it is a complex, it's a complex weave that we have on this. I think too, I, as a, um, a teacher, this, this has to be the, you know, if I had one cause to crusade on, having worked with, with young children and young people, um, this is it. And you quite, you know, correctly picked up what I, what I had said there, because I, there are days I know where I would say I'm not worried about whether or not they get 100% in their maths, but I'd like them to be able to have a conversation with the child next to them and I would like them to know you know how to go down to to the shops and and buy something and you are um quite rightly in one sense sort of fighting the system academically because they want teachers when when you would come into their classrooms and they you want to to take that child to go and do something now some of them were would be very accommodating for others they just felt that that was well that was another thing you were going to have to catch them up on or ca whereas what I wanted to say was mm -hmm. actually no this is not about catching them up this is about something that will facilitate what you're doing now it is a very difficult balance and a very very kind of delicate path to walk and I, I know too that um, you know though I, I mentioned particular provision but it, as uh, John was just saying there we are not habilitation specialists, but as QTVIs, we are trained to do a certain amount of, of life skills and to, to basically support what gets started by those specialists. And in the, the particular school that, that was our base, uh, you're in a school where corridors are full of things. You can't teach a child to trail along the wall. There isn't a room, well, there is a room, but it can get used for different things that, where you would want it set up to go and do some cooking with a child or go and, and you know, practice doing shopping and all these kind of skills. And in a, you know, in a school that, that is, is not built in the right way to do that and also has an ever-increasing um, school population, you're losing space. So it is very much, I would say, I would rather have a child that could communicate with their peers that understood how to shop, that, that could pour juice for themselves. That's things as simple that you take for granted as that, being able to tie their shoelaces. Um, but it requires a negotiation with, with the academic sort of system, really, to say, OK, we need to be able to take them out and do that. And as Dominic quite rightly said, maybe we should be doing that for the first two years of primary school, you know, for, for argument's sake. I mean, I'm throwing it out as a, a, um, a, you know, as an option that actually it's more important that we get these children supported so that then they can make the most of, of their academic attainment because trying to do what we do now, which is we try and do bits and pieces and we, we try and, and fit in bits of life skills. I mean, I think I only attempted to have three things I was going to do with a particular child in a term because I knew that time was against us in terms of the other children I was supporting. I managed, I think, two lessons on, on working on, on tying shoelaces, you know, you know, tying a ribbon, tying things to do with their hair. That's not enough. But there are other children that, that you go and visit, other things that you have to do, other things you need to see. And, and that is an, they're important skills. They're skills that make these children, I say, the same. They, they, they bring them up with their peers. They want to know how to tie a ribbon in their hair if they're a girl, and how to tie a bow. And I'm trying not to sound too sort of simplistic, but that matters. So we need a conversation about how we put that kind of life skills attainment into, mm -hmm. uh, into school and how we negotiate with teachers, how we negotiate with the Curriculum for Excellence to do that. So. I think to life skills attainment, mm -hmm. is, are there any schools or local authorities that are striving to try and achieve that level in Scotland? No. I'm very concerned about time no. this morning because we, we've got a lot to get through and we've got another panel uh, as well. So, 
could could both questioners and, and 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 those on the panel try and keep their answers reasonably short. So if you don't mind. Uh, no would be my answer. It's short. it's it's trying <laughs> to to join in with with fitting it in with everything else. Yes. Tracy, in our school, yes, because the government and Glasgow City Council built a purpose-built sensory impairment school that had all the bells and whistles. Hydrotherapy, art room, music room, home economics room, life skills house with hoists, with bedrooms, with cooking facilities, all adapted to try and support these young people um, to, to gain as many independent living skills as possible and socialise. We now have a school, if I can just give you some numbers, in, in the session 2012 to 13, Hazelwood had 18 teachers. This year for the next session, we've been offered 10 teachers. We have negotiated and been given 11.4 teachers. That's from 2013 to, to 15, 16, 2015, 16. Can you imagine how difficult it is with a, a group of 53 children in a school, many of whom are in wheelchairs, how do you move those children around the school safely, never mind educate them? There's been an undermining of the education system for these disabled children. Their visual impairment is perhaps the main barrier. Like my daughter, her main barrier to learning is her visual impairment. But she has other disabilities as well, like her, her peers and the rest of the children in the school. How, we are going, how the school is going to cope with 11.4 teachers next year means that the management of the school will be in classroom. The school will not be managed properly. There is no budget to bring all the attributes of this fantastic purpose-built school online and make it actually live and thrive and provide the widest kind of education possible. Um, I think those figures speak for themselves. Looking at other provisions, um, obviously Scotland has a, a spectrum of types of provision. Obviously, um, that's very much a specialist, you know, special school environment. The majority of children go to their local school, supported by a peripatetic teacher. Depending on the individual needs of the child, the peri teacher might come in once a week, could be once a month, as Sally mentioned. Now, so the, the onus responsibility then is on the individual school to support that child. Now, those teachers won't necessarily know and understand sight loss and how to support it effectively. Time is, or the emphasis is on the academic side and not enough time on the social skills development side of things. That's the case for the majority of children across Scotland. And the TVIs, as, as, as we will discuss, the numbers are dwindling, the ability or, or their awareness of, of visual impairment and how to support it, that is perhaps not as good as it should be because many of them are inexperienced. So as a consequence, we're getting lots and lots of children right across the country who are really struggling. Siobhan McMahon on this, because I know that she wanted to ask some questions in this kind of area, so Siobhan. Thank you. It was indeed about the importance of the habilitation skills um, and to independence, because we've got a lot of written evidence on that. Um, and, and following on from the questions that you just got, I got the sense that some of you thought that it was working well in uh, habilitation skills in some areas, some thought not so much. But is there any data out there? Is there any studies being taken to say, because we've spoke about the importance of it, so I don't need to, to ask about that. I understand that that's important, but have we actually um, got any data to support if that's happening or not, both in mainstream and, and in special schools? Uh, I guess looking at me from the, <laughs> from the university, uh, no, I'm not aware of any, any concrete hard data. I mean, there's anecdotal stuff uh, that Dominic and, and um, Sally would know. But um, uh, in terms of uh, hard concrete data that we can look at and analyse, no. There's, uh, I, mean, uh, I, am about, I mean, I'd, I've obviously, um, to, just to set this in context, when I, when I wrote this, this was at the end of me working for the local authority to now be taking on a position um, um, for Royal Blind. And certainly what I'm about to undertake um, for purely this reason, um, which I think I'm probably allowed to say, is that I'm, I'm, I'm writing to all the heads of service in visual impairment to ask them where their gaps are for this particular reason. But that's in terms of informing some kind of service provision. But, so that would give me, that gives me an idea, but there isn't anything in terms of that will be, I hope, all kind of, heads of service and visual impairment or somebody in the authority because sometimes it is just one person 
um, getting back to, to us and saying, OK, this is, this is what we need, this is what we're not managing. To, and I know that it will be um, the, the life skills, the, that kind of um, aspect of it. But that, in terms of hard data, no, I don't have. I, I, I can say also that habilitation is extremely patchy in the way that it's delivered across Scotland. Um, in some local authorities, it's delivered by the social work department. In other uh, local authorities, it's by the education. Some, it's local societies, including RNIBs, Edinburgh and Lothians, or Blind Children UK. Um, there's no one set pattern in which habilitation is delivered. The other problem is that what is regarded as habilitation, which is different from rehabilitation, because as I say, adults are rehabilitated. A child has to develop and no one understands um, you know, how, to, how to engage with the world. That's habilitation. Many of the people who are delivering, delivering the training aren't habilitation specialists. They've not undergone the postgraduate diploma um, that is either done through uh, the Institute of London in partnership with Edinburgh University. So many of them are rehab workers who are mostly used to working with old people. All of a sudden, they've maybe got a young child on their books. Um, that's not good enough. And that's something that's been addressed by us, and I know that other people here have responded to that as well. We need habilitation specialists. I don't care who delivers it. I don't care how it's funded, but we need it. And, for instance, I'll give you an example. When I was in South Lanarkshire for 20 years, we had a sit-down meeting between the social work and education to say, look, we've got kids here. They need this input. Who's going to deliver it? And they couldn't agree on who would deliver it. Likewise, you've got many children who are maybe um, educated across authorities. Um, so, for instance, maybe a Glasgow child um, with, with, uh, who was educated in South Lanarkshire. Glasgow City Council refused to give that young guy habilitation training. So that was a young boy who's now training to be a lawyer um, who had to park his backside down in Glasgow City Council and demand that they support him. They, they were embarrassed into doing it. That's unacceptable. So we have to develop something that ensures that our children are being supported more effectively. But is it happening? I mean, because you, you mentioned uh, Blind Children UK, they, they, they talked about in their evidence, do you know, preschool years. I mean, is it happening? Is there any evidence to say that, do you know, it's happening in, in preschool years? Um, it goes back to Mary Scanlon's point, really. At nursery, do we know of anything that's happening at nursery schools that would be positive? To ring in Tracy at this point. Tracy. <laughs> The answer to that is no. What I can tell you is that Glasgow's habilitation team is based at Hazelwood School, as indeed their VI outreach team is. The habilitation team in Glasgow is two members of staff for the whole of the city. They are wonderful, but there's only two of them. My own daughter, sorry, my own daughter has been able to um, get ha habilitation training through what's now Blind Children UK, which we kind of know as, as Guide Dogs UK, and they seem to be rapidly trying to train more habilitation staff. But there's just an absolute dare. And, and, and I can say that the Glasgow habilitation workers were actually not paid for originally, or the training wasn't paid for by Glasgow City Council, it was paid by, I think it was Cathy Spower as part of uh, yes. NHS yes. Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Now, they're concerned that those two, one of them's about to retire, I don't know if you know that yet, no. um, and, and they're worried that that person is not going to be replaced. We spoke about a number of the barriers um, that are put in place um, in order for young children to get the habilitation skills uh, necessary to be independent. But what would be the main barrier? Because obviously, if you're focusing on something at the minute, th there was numerous examples there in the evidence, but what is the main barrier to this, would you say? So we had a pupil support assistant, an excellent pupil support assistant, who was funded to undertake her habilitation diploma. She asked Glasgow if she could have a job and left because there wasn't a role for her within Glasgow. She now, now works for Blind Children UK. Um, I think if you were to ask around schools within the, you know, within the pupil support um, area in schools, you may well find people who are interested in doing their habilitation diploma. But who's going to replace them in class? You know, it comes down to money at the end of the day, doesn't it? That, you know, that is, that is part of it. There, there is a desire um, for people to take up the habilitation training course. Now, the SSC, the Scottish Census Centre, they did deliver that training, but the numbers weren't near because local authorities weren't releasing staff and said they didn't have the money. So many of them, is that right, John? Yes, so, so many of them then had to go and get training down at Wakefield um, in, in Yorkshire. Um, so that's costing local authorities who do decide to send staff a lot more money. Um, 
so basically I think what we need to do is, is force local authorities to recognise this as an issue. Now I know that the Scottish Council on Visual Impairment, SCOVI, that is going to be one of the, the things that they're going to try and press forward and start challenging local authorities through COSL, etc. And even yourselves as politicians here within the Scottish Parliament to actually accept that this is an issue that needs addressed. Um, and what we need to do is make sure that the money is there, either ring-fenced in some way or whatever, but the money is there to ensure that we have appropriately trained habilitation specialists working in partnership with teaching professionals to make sure that our children are more prepared than they actually are. Yeah, simple answer. Qualified staff. Okay, okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, Liam MacArthur. Yeah, I was going to um, touch on the issue of curriculum for excellence, but Dominic, I think you covered that quite comprehensively. But one of the things that you were saying had me thinking, is this presumption of mainstreaming actually, or, or, or the way in which it's being interpreted and applied working against the interests of, of those with visual impairments or, or those with multiple uh, disabilities. I mean, again, I was struck by what you were saying, Sally, about even in the early stages of primary, actually getting some, some core fundamental life skills nailed down um, uh, more kind of proficiently would be more advantageous than maybe some of the other things that their, their, their uh, non-visually impaired peers uh, may be up to. Is there a way of, 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 of applying this presumption in a more... Um, flexible fashion that would, would perhaps address some of the, the concerns that you're talking about? I think, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, when I, I started this job nine years ago, I, I you know, recognised that, that um, the whole inclusion issue, presumption of mainstreaming, um, when it works well, is, is good. Um, and the longer I have done the job, the more I have realised that for, for a lot of children, it is not the best place for them to be, but with the presumption of mainstreaming, and my sort of colleagues that probably know more st statistics than I do can correct, but the, because of that, then the, the number of places for children that would be better supported within a more specialised environment has, has reduced. So um, I, certainly on, on my caseload, I think of 28, 29 children previously, I had two children with severe cerebral palsy who were in a mainstream setting, who um, it is very difficult for for a standard, I would say QTVI, <laughs> to be qualified to cover everything from a blind baby to a child um, with CP that's maybe, you know, that's in a mainstream school. Um, it, it, I don't know what am I allowed to say. It's, it's an issue that I think is a, it's a real problem. I, I, I think presumption of mainstreaming, when it works, it works. And when it doesn't, we need somewhere. As even... As a, as a completely personal idea of, for instance, of mine, because I, I have a, a new role and a, and a new um, kind of um, path to carve on this, if you like, I would like to be able to, um, to, to gather together some of the children that are in mainstream who we are only able to see, say, once a term or once a month, and I would like to have somewhere that, I could, that we could bring them with their teachers to spend a day or two days doing so even only and it's not a big thing it's not a kind of what it should be it's not really really regular but I think we need that kind of provision within that mainstream we need we need somewhere where we can actually go and say for this for so many days or so many days a year we come and we learn these things that it is very difficult to deliver in a mainstream setting. It's not that, that can be done at a local level. You know, the North Lanarkshire Council used to have a, an, an area set aside where kids would be extracted and they could go and, and learn about life skills, um, but local authority cutbacks closed that. Um, I'm a product of mainstream education. I lost my sight when I was 16. Um, I went to my local school, lost my sight when I was 16, and then went to a unit in Erdingston Grammar for blind and partially sighted pupils, um, and I went on to university. Now, the, the, the point I'm making there is that you know, we need a presumption of mainstream. We need, we need to, to ensure that the majority of our children who just live with a sight loss go to the local school or as near as, as, as possible to that. I think that's vital in terms of inclusion. I also think it's important to have a spectrum of provision so you've, there is a need for children to go to some of the Royal Blind School or indeed Hazelwood because that's a more specialised environment where they'll not necessarily get that if they went to a local special school even with a peripatetic visual impairment support. I think that's, that's why I was framing the question the way that I, I, I did, that I wasn't suggesting that the, the presumption itself was a, a wrong approach to take, but actually the way that it's implied and the consequences that, that flow from that may not necessarily in every instance be meeting the needs of, of, 
of children whose whose needs may may, may change over, yeah. over mainstreaming over. causes problems. There's no doubt about that. And I've alluded to some of them today. You know the the, the, the tightness of the curriculum. Um, the the even even as Sally mentioned, it's hard for some of the kids to navigate along a corridor because it's jam packed or cluttered, and you know a lot of inaccessible schools that's not necessarily in, you know, VI friendly. Let's say, um, so there are huge huge issues there, which certainly cause problems. Um, but that's not to say that that's not ultimately what we want for the majority of the children to go to the local school. But the, the quality of the support that's been provided to those children within a local school, in many cases, is not good enough. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that end point is quite important. Not only uh, should we have mainstream teachers looking at a, a, an inclusive pedagogy approach, but also it really is the quality of, uh, of the VI staff. We have children who are supported by non-qualified teachers of, of visual impairment. And... Um, how can that be? We have a mandatory qualification for it to be qualified, and yet we still, with a with a five year statute on it, so the local authority is allowed to employ these people who are not qualified with a five year statute. But this is not actually at all uh, uh, looked at. The uh, inspectorate, HMIE, don't inspect against this. Uh, the GTCS don't inspect against this. And so I have just recently trained uh, uh, or educated a teacher. Uh, who've been teaching pupils for 20 years who's not qualified and thought, oh, I'd better get qualified. How can this be the case that we allow unqualified teachers of visually impaired children to support teachers of visually impaired children? All the teachers are qualified, don't get me wrong on that, but the actual specialist qualification, we have many teachers in Scotland who are unqualified who are supporting, and they're doing their very best, this is not a criticism of them, but they are not qualified. And this can't be allowed to continue. And, and I'd, I'd you're not saying that these are bad teachers or poor teachers, you're just saying they don't, they, they don't hope. Uh, they, well, you just, sorry, you just yeah. mentioned a very specific example, yeah. a teacher who's been speaking, teaching for 20 years. Was that teacher a poor teacher, or were they just did not hold a certification? Uh, well, I haven't gone and um, done a long-term assessment on that, on, on that teacher. Um, the fact that they were supported by other colleagues and they didn't understand the theory that we were doing, if you, I, I, that pupil, that teacher, as a pupil is my student, um, certainly benefited from the qualification. They got a lot more out of it and understood the theoretical aspects and understood... That. I'm sure that's absolutely the case. But I accept that absolutely. What, what I'm trying to be clear about is that the, the teachers that you're talking about, generally, not generally, not individuals, but these teachers are teaching to a standard which we would expect them to do, although they do not necessarily hold the specialist qualification. How do we know, How do we know that? How, well, if, I'm, if, I'm if, you if, because if, you... if they're not being assessed by Education Scotland as part of school inspections, how do we know that that teacher is there or, or bluffing, you know, just working their way through the motions? To me, it should be more than that. This is an enhanced curriculum you're trying to teach kids. It's not just about helping them to, to you know, access what the classroom teacher's doing. It's the, uh, the other skills that need supported. And unless that person truly understands sight loss, then, then that can't be happening unless they know the theory and they also know the strategies and the resources that are available. That's a prime concern I would have. I think we're, what we're also beginning to see here in Scotland, it's been happening in England, but I think it's, we're starting to see it here in Scotland as well, with the presumption of mainstreaming and local authorities trying to save money, what we're seeing is emerging of VI and HI services into a joint sensory impairment service. Many of those are now being managed by somebody who has no experience whatsoever of visual impairment. Um, many of them don't have any experience of, of hearing impairment either. They just happen to be managers. Um, personally, I don't think that's good enough either. I think whoever heads up the Visual Impairment Service in Scotland really should have a deep understanding of what is in the best interest of children and they're not just going through the motions of managing people. There's a, it's, it's, it should be deeper than that. Well, also, what we've not touched on here is, and I'm hoping we've got time to do so, is the fact that many of our children are actually not even able to access school intranet systems, mm -hmm. school networks. Um, there's a huge issue just now with children using handheld devices such as Braille notes and iPads who basically have been locked out. They've been prevented from learning at the same time as their sighted peers, which is against the law. And those children are... Um, 
expected to maybe go away into study and research and, and gather information or download from Moodle or various other intranet systems. And because local authority networks um, are, are not allowing them access, they're, they're, they're not learning. Or the system refreshes, um, and many of those children who might use JAWS or Supernova software, and that then becomes redundant. And I have seen personally seen children who are, could go weeks without being able to access a computer because they've been blocked out. So there's a huge issue, it's in our report here, about the problem of accessing the curriculum in itself, which significantly affects attainment. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we, we are pushed for time, but I, I want to get a couple of other members in before we finish. But I will say that there are a number of areas and questions that we do want to pursue beyond this. So we, I think we'll be writing to you to try and, you know, uh, with additional questions and hopefully you'll be able to provide additional information beyond today. Um, uh, Chick Brody. Thank you. Um, just two very brief questions. We've heard how bad everything you know, is, and we're, you know, we understand that. But um, there are pockets. We mentioned Tayside earlier, uh, and we've had information that East Renfrewshire Count, uh, Council uh, suggests that mainstream schools were doing well at education, educating children with sensory requirements. And we've talked about the spectrum. But um, why are we, and I mean we around the table, not just the politicians. Why are we not able to ensure that there is a cross-communication as to look at the best practice in pockets of Scotland so that those that are not performing eh, might benefit from the good experiences? Yeah, I think um, that's a very interesting question. One is, um, in order to establish, we're comparing like with like, so there are very, very good examples across Scotland. Highland is one of them. Aberdeen is another one of those. But we need to compare that. In order to put best practice into operation, we need to do that. Now, part of the role of the Scottish Sensory Centre, we've just released a mentoring scheme where we're going to have... Um, uh, senior, uh, experienced, qualified teachers of, the, of visually impaired from different local authorities mentoring newly qualified staff from other different authorities uh, in order to support and give examples of that best practice. A lot of shadowing, a lot of mentoring, come on. And so um, it's funded by uh, the Scottish Government in order for us to do this. So we are trying to, as you said earlier, get that connectivity across Scotland by showing and demonstrating through the senior qualified staff with new qualified mentoring systems. So part of that is we're trying to incorporate that at the moment. Th various CPD opportunities that both ourselves, RNIB, and at the Royal Blind are doing as well are trying to establish best practice criteria and also try to um, put on career professional development learning courses of that best practice but those courses are only successful if local authorities release staff to come and take them up. There's no point in us as the Scottish Sensory Centre demonstrating what these best practices are, either through online or through various other systems, uh, multimedia approaches or through face-to-face, -face, if local authority aren't allowing other staff to access those courses. So um, there is some connectivity, as you say, uh, but there could be a lot more. I think it's also part of, of my, my job as um, chairperson of Savvy, which is just a voluntary um, organisation of, of teachers, mostly teachers across Scotland. And uh, we have an issue with, with members not being allowed to, to come to meetings. People who actually, part of the, the fundamental reason for doing it is to get us together, yes, to, to talk about good practice, yes, to get um, other professionals in to speak to us to Im improve our own practice, a lot of why we do it is because we can sit in a room and we can discuss what we're doing, quite literally from Orkney to the borders. And if there are areas where we're coming unstuck, you can actually find, usually find another teacher that, that can, can so, you know, support that or put you in touch with someone else. But quite often I, I have, I would love to be there. You know, I say, I'd like to come, but I can't get out of school. I can't get out of school because I can't be released because there's no one to do my job or there's no one I can't you know, be paid to, to come out. Um, train fares coming down from Aberdeen, can we start the meeting at 10 o'clock because then I can get the cheaper, the cheaper train ticket? It's things as fundamental as that that, that are, are, you know, sort of making that kind of connectivity, albeit um, some of it very informal, um, is, is being lost because of that. 
also Savvy have been quite instrumental in trying to push forward this whole agenda of ensuring that um, assistive technology is, is available for blind and partially sighted kids across Scotland. In our report, we've mentioned a document called I Right, which is getting IT right for blind and partially sighted children across Scotland. That was Savvy that was instrumental in developing that. So by bringing professionals together, identifying what the issues are across the majority of local authorities in Scotland with regards to IT, they've come up with a, a very positive example of where it is working so that staff within the local authority can go back to their IT managers, their corporate IT team and say, it's not working in our authority, why not? Because it's working in Aberdeen or they can get it to work in Edinburgh. Why can't we allow our children with a Braille note-taking device to access our intranet system? Mm -hmm. So that's the type of opportunity that has to be nurtured so that that's much more effective. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. There are a number of areas we haven't covered, and I'm, I'm aware of that um, from our side, and, and I'm sure from, from yours as well. Uh, but as I said a moment ago, um, we're very tight for time this morning, but we will write to you. Um, I, if there's anything particular you want to supply to us, then please just go ahead, be proactive about that. But we will write to you with a number of questions which we haven't got through, uh, our areas we haven't covered this morning, um, just because of time. So I, I'm going to bring this particular session to an end. Um, but uh, we're very grateful for your attendance this morning and for giving up your time to come and speak to us. I, I know this is a very big and complex issue, uh, and this, as you said earlier, Dominic, barely scratches the surface. But uh, we hope that we can get further information from you which will help us in understanding a bit better some of the issues and problems that these uh, young, young people are facing in Scotland because we recognise the problems that so, some of you have brought to the table here today. So thank you very much once again for your attendance uh, and can I suspend briefly.
can I uh, bring the committee um, back to the second panel we have this morning? Uh, we have Heather Gray, National Deaf Children's Society, uh, Rachel O'Neill, Murray House School of Education, Dr Roger Cameron, Child Protection Research Centre, and Catherine Finiston, British Association of Teachers of the Deaf Scotland. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, can I welcome all of you uh, this morning for attending? Um, we're just going to go uh, straight to questions, and can I begin the questions with Mark Griffin? Thanks, I wanted to go into questions um, around issues around teachers of the deaf in schools in Scotland. Just kick off a, around the, the shortage. We've heard in written evidence um, from Aberdeen City Council um, about the age profile of teachers of the deaf and generally being um, the majority of qualified staff are in their mid to late 50s and just to see whether you agree with that and what actually needs to be to be done now to to, to bridge that gap between um, boosting the numbers to an acceptable level as the ultimate ambition but actually just covering for the staff who are going to be leaving the service in the next 10 to 15 years. I, I trained um, 39 years ago and at that time the government had ring-fenced funding and it meant that all local authorities had the opportunity to appoint people to go on the training. Um, we did one full-time year's course, so people committed themselves to, to that year and became qualified. When the colleges and universities merged, um, they, they had to um, ensure that the modules were in line with the universities. So um, it was done as a modular course, I think initially eight modules over a period of up to five years. And circumstances change for people over, the, over five years. Um, you know, people get married, they have children, etc. Um, at that time, there was also an, a monetary incentive um, to do the course, it wasn't it wasn't a lot. I think it was in the region of two hundred and something pounds, but it was some incentive to do the, the qualification. Whereas now there is no incentive. What you find is teachers who um, are extremely interested in working in deaf education uh, um, apply for the courses. Some have to pay themselves. Some have to go to authorities and ask for funding. And if that's agreed, they continue with their job, their, their day job, and have to do the modules in addition to that. Um, so it, it can take quite a lot of time, and you don't get the same... It's only the people who really want to do the job that will commit themselves to that, but other people won't. So that it's, it's caused a national shortage. When you advertise for teachers of the deaf, qualified teachers of the deaf... Um, you rarely get any applicants. Um, if you're lucky, you'll get one. I'd just like to talk about the course from the university point of view because I'm on the postgraduate diploma at Murray House and we have some people coming on the course quite late in life and we know that out there there are 30% of teachers <laughs> working with deaf children who are unqualified, so uh, local authorities are sometimes not sending us people. The people who come usually are highly motivated uh, one thing I would like to see is more deaf people coming forward, and that is quite a difficult thing because getting through to te becoming qualified as a teacher and then finding out about the possibilities once you're working in a local authority I mean we don't often get, uh, for example, people with fluent sign language coming through. Um, and the age profile is quite old, that's true, but some authorities, I think uh, Falkirk is one of them, have made provision in advance by looking around for younger teachers and um, Fife is another council who's done this as well, looking out for very good teachers who they see in mainstream and sending those, and attracting those to a service and then sending them on, on the diploma. So it depends on the authority's perspective. Small authorities, rural authorities struggle, I think, most. Dr Cameron? I mean, I think some of the history about deaf teaching would be instructive at this point. Um, there are so few teachers because, because deaf people were only allowed to become um, deaf teachers very recently and it took a concerted amount of uh, lobbying to change the rules to allow deaf people to train at all to become teachers of the deaf and that's why we've got so few. 
Um, one of, the, one of the, the preconditions of becoming a qualified teacher was you had to be able to hear what was going on in the back of the classroom. Now, clearly, a lot of deaf people who were qualified and uh, intelligent enough to become teachers um, uh, weren't able to do so because of those rules. And I was one of those people. So I'm very thankful for that rule change that allowed me to qualify. But if we're looking at why there's such a dearth of deaf people as teachers of the deaf, um, that's the reason. And we need to make a concerted and proactive effort to build uh, that share of the teacher of the deaf um, uh, population uh, that are deaf to a much higher level. Thank you. Uh, Heather. Yeah, just to um, think again about those statistics. So there are 200 teachers uh, of the deaf in Scotland, according to the Consortium for Research in Deaf Education. And um, over a third uh, of those are, are unqualified. We've seen through the CRIDE report in the last few years quite a significant decline. So we know that over 50% of teachers of the deaf will retire in 10 to 15 years. And um, we also know that it is incredibly difficult um, to attract teachers um, because there isn't the incentives that, that Cathy spoke about. So the additional qualification does not bring with it um, any additional responsibility allowance, which I think is a major factor. But I do think we have a piece of work to do in terms of really promoting um, the work of Teachers of the Deaf and the huge impact that it has for children and how it can really transform children's lives too. So I think there is work to be done on really promoting um, the work of the Teachers um, of the Deaf um, and really starting to address this quite significant reduction that we're seeing and the difficulties in getting young people into the profession. I think it's absolutely right that we should be supporting and encouraging more deaf young people to become teachers of the deaf. And interestingly, we've got three of our young campaigners that are interested in becoming teachers of the deaf. And um, that, that is really important um, in terms of just giving young people the confidence um, to aspire to, to, to go into the profession. But we have work to do on um, promoting the profession and the impact that it can have and the transformational change it can make. OK, just to pick up on a point uh, Dr Cameron made about the qualifications of teachers of the deaf in particular um, with BSL, currently the, the standard is for BSL um, level one, and I was struck by a comment Dr Cameron said that um, previously teachers weren't allowed to teach unless they could hear what was going on in the back of the classroom, but actually a teacher who only has BSL level one won't know what her, his or her own pupils will be signing in the classroom, so surely they weren't um, qualified to be in the, the, classroom, the classroom either, um, which seems to be a, a, a disparity. Um, what, what are your views on the level of BSL qualification that teachers have and what you think that could be the impact on pupils learning when some pupils themselves um, have a much um, higher uh, standard of BSL than the teachers themselves. Quite right, it's very unfair. It can have a serious uh, detrimental impact on their learning. If, if, if the language that's been used um, by the person who's instructing them isn't clear and they have a low skill level of British Sign Language, <clears throat> you know, simple mistakes can be made. I mean, if you think about even like the English term iron, you know, FE in the scientific world as, as an abbreviation. And we've seen examples of uh, people in the classroom using this sign for iron, as in the thing you iron your clothes with. Those are the kind of mistakes that are being made. And isolated deaf children in a mainstream environment aren't able to work out what that's supposed to be. It's crucial that the sign language is of such a, is of a, is fluent and of an, a, a, a standard that allows the deaf child to conceptualize what they're learning. And you, you talked, Mark, about level one, and we've done a lot of work on, uh, we, we do a lot of work at the, in, in the centre and at the university about developing science signs, but none of this, this uh, knowledge is being uh, transferred or, or is, it's not being replicated anywhere. And we're doing, there is such good examples of, of work going on, um, but what's clearly happening is if the sign language standard in the school is not clear and it's not good enough, then the kids have got no chance of learning. 
when we develop these science, science together um, as a group, you're talking about a large group of uh, experts from the areas of science, linguistics, all those areas coming together and doing an awful lot of hard work just to get those concepts out in sign language. And what we're doing at the Scottish Century Centre is helping teachers teach, um, well, both deaf and hearing kids, because I'll give you an example if you wouldn't... Uh, if you think about the, the concepts mass... Anybody know? Now, does the committee know what mass is? Can you describe what mass or volume is? Okay. It's very difficult, isn't it? Just through the English word. And then when you think about gravity... Okay, I'm sure you're all familiar with gravity... <laughs> right, so in sign language, look, the, the fist that I'm using here is the sign for mass, right? Everything's there, okay? Then you've got the gravity is the force that's acting on a, 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 an object. So we have this sign, gravity, as in to come down to earth, okay? As Mary quite rightly showed with the pen. And if you put the two together, conceptually, visually, you have weight. And that is what weight is. As a concept. Now you can see how visual, visually superior that is to trying to explain something in English. So not only are deaf kids going to benefit if we can use sign language with them, everybody's going to benefit. Can you imagine trying to explain to a deaf child without the teacher of the deaf who might not be there in lip speaking, mass, volume? They're not going to get it. If you've got somebody who can sign, sign like that, then they're going to get the concepts immediately. So it's incredibly disappointing that we allow teachers of the deaf to qualify with only level one BSL. I quite agree, and I think it's a, a great science lesson, Audrey. The work of the Scottish Sensory Centre Glossary is really important in, in telling teachers of deaf children and communication support workers about new signs and concepts that they can use. The current advice that we have from the government, and it's the government advice, is level one. It's the same all over the UK, and it is no way near enough for people who use sign language. What's more, it keeps teachers of the deaf assuming that regulation keeps people assuming that most deaf children are not going to use much sign in my submission and the submission from the british deaf association we saw that actually there are large numbers of children larger numbers in children using some sort of sign than other parts of the uk and we know as well that teachers of the deaf when they work with signing pupils often have level two as what they regard as a good level and um, if you talk to people in the deaf community, they are shocked by this because level six is regarded as a good level for people who are interpreting. Level three is seen as a minimum. When I say level three, I mean something like a higher in a language. Now, if any of you have got a higher in a modern language, could you teach in it? That is the level which we're seeing as the minimum level for teachers of deaf children. Now, that's what I say to my students. The, the government regulation says level one or more as appropriate. And that vagueness of the language, more as appropriate, is very unhelpful. So I feel that in Scotland we're in an interesting position now with the BSL Bill, and I expect that guidance to be revised upwards. Whether it's revised for all teachers of deaf children or whether it's revised for those, children, those teachers working with signing students and the under fives, I don't know yet which way it will go. But I think we've got to remember that there, when we're talking about the word deaf, in the, UK, in, in the Scottish context, we're talking about two quite different groups of children. There is some overlap between them, and the signing pupils at the moment are not getting a good deal. Thank you. Heather? Can I just put this in, in, in a bit of perspective? 71% of um, peripatetic hearing impairment services in Scotland don't have any teachers qualified um, to BSL level three or beyond. And there are actually six services in Scotland um, where there are teachers with no qualifications in BSL. So I think that gives uh, a sense of the, the, the dimension really of, uh, of the challenge that, that, that we face just now too. We recently um, had a deaf learners conference and we had 21 BSL uh, users at that conference. And they very strongly and clearly told us that they needed to have support which was far more fluent than they currently had if they were going to succeed and to really achieve their potential and I think we really need to listen to the voices of those young people coming from that deaf learners conference um, and, and identify the need to, to do something about this but those are certainly the statistics just now um, in relation to BSL qualifications and teachers of the deaf in Scotland today. Thank you. Mark? Thank okay. you. Um, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. Can I, can I start just with a, a little plea for 
plain English in some of the submissions. When I look at uh, a sentence like, part of, the, part of the solution is to transmogrify the educator from adhering to the sophisticated deficit model to one that generates empowerment of the pupil. I can barely get it out. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, it's, it's no one It's no one here. It's no one here. From one of the first panel members, that, uh, you know, just for clarity, I don't, I don't think it was Andy here. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I just, I just plead for plain English. Um, I was going to ask a little bit about uh, some of the suggestions that have been made in terms of uh, technology support uh, and how that could best be introduced to give the biggest impact on uh, pupils with uh, hearing difficulties or sensory impairment. What would, what would give the biggest hit? Um, well, um where, where I am in Falkirk, we have um, sound field systems which we're installing into all the primary one, two and three classes, um, into classes where we have children with unilateral losses, severe conductive losses, um, and we're finding that that's benefiting all of the children in the classroom. It's also benefiting the teacher because it helps um, the teacher's voice they don't have to project it as loudly. And all of the children regardless of where they are in the class, get the same level of, of um, volume fro from the teacher. Um, there are also radio aid systems, modern radio aid systems, which are discrete. And uh, any of the children that we have that will benefit from a radio aid system will be supplied with one. But they, they cost about £1,000 each. And we've had, Batwad have had people um, writing and asking, how do we go about, they're a single teacher of the deaf um, in an authority, and they're saying, how do we go about getting a radio aid system and funding for that, or for a sound field system um, within our authority? And that it's very much at the, the hands of the education services whether or not there's funding for that. And is that the one major adaptation you think would make a, a huge impact? I think in, um, in technology, children also have um, laptops. or, um, But that, that would be the major one um, for us because it means that if they're wearing a radio aid system, regardless of where they are in the class, they will always hear the, the teacher's voice at the same volume and be tuned in to what, what is happening. Just taking an example of uh, what some local authorities do, um, for example, in, in, in my own Midlothian local authority, when, when schools are closed due to snow or inclement weather, uh, children's homework is made available uh, through smartphones or through uh, the internet. How, 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 are, uh, how are sensory impaired children impacted by that? Does it disadvantage them hugely? Are there, are there adaptations that could be done to that to enable them to carry on with their uh, education? Children are able to now access um, support through GLOW. Um, and that can roll out to all of the children if the parents if the parents apply. Um, so there's no can disadvantage. Be signed up to that. So there isn't a disadvantage Good. there. And very often, if a child is ill or off, the parent will contact the school and ask for work to be sent home, and the teacher will do her best to present um, challenging, but. Um, homework which they're going to be able to cope with. If that's not possible, then the teacher of the deaf in our authority will go out and do a home visit and tutor the child. I mean, technology is obviously very important, but the, the, what underlies that will be a bilingual education that empowers um, deaf children. So if they're able to read, then they're going to be able to work from home and um, the same as uh, any other child. If they're given language when they're born um, and they grow up uh, confident using sign language and English in a bilingual way, then they shouldn't have any problems. They should be able to access the written English just the same as their hearing peers. Um, and like their hearing peers, they shouldn't have to rely on technology for everything. Uh, sorry, sorry uh, Colin, sorry. Rachel, I know wanted to come in. Yeah, I just wanted to say about the technology. I don't think there's one technological hit that will solve the problem. Because, as Audrey says, the issue mainly is access to an early language. But in Scotland, what we need more of is educational audiologists. We don't have enough. Those people can make the technological adjustments that are needed 
in local authorities, especially if they were able to work across many local authorities. Authorities are reluctant to employ one because perhaps they don't have enough work for one. So they seem, it seems an obvious job to give an essential service such as the SSC to work in many local authorities. Those people can fit um, radio aid systems, they can, they can advise on um, sound field systems, they can advise parents, they're very, very valuable. They're basically teachers of deaf children who've had additional training and in Scotland we need more of them. Is it an example of a local authority that employs one? Yes, Fife employs one. Um, and there, there, are, there is one freelance who's working across some local authorities in, in the West. And is that Falkirk it? has got one. It has been hard to recruit as well, hasn't it? Yes. Very difficult to recruit because there's so few of them. Do we know how many there are through Scotland? Five. Five, and that's a, a significant reduction um, over the last few mm-hmm. years. And often what we're seeing is um, if post holders leave, um, those posts are not being replaced. That certainly was the case in Ayrshire and the Lothians, and in the Lothians. so we're seeing um, a reduction mm-hmm. and you know what, one of the points I was going to make was just that of um, actually there's no point in having the technology um, if we don't have the expertise to use it properly and again a very strong message coming through from the Deaf Learners Conference was the young people saying actually the teachers don't know how to use technology and one of the young people you know, gave this really um, funny incident of where the um, teacher hadn't switched off the radio mic and the kids heard the whole conversation that went on in the staff room. So it is, it's, a, it's quite a fundamental point, but our young people are telling us that actually it's critical that our staff actually know um, how to use the technology that we've got. And this issue about the reduction in... Um, educational audiologists, we, we need to ensure that there's a solution. Ayrshire have um, skilled up one of their teachers of the deaf to be a specialist. There are ways to do this, but it's clearly an issue that not everybody has um, the skills and expertise to use the technology that we do have properly. Is there any indication that councils are increasingly sharing that resource? Or? No, the opposite, actually. I think at times of cuts, they're tending not to share. So previously we had an educational audiologist based in Edinburgh, who also worked with all the Lothians, and that has been um, not replaced because the authorities couldn't agree. And the service has definitely deteriorated as a result. The, the, the children used to have excellent service from that educational audiologist <coughs> right the way through from, from 0 to 18. Look, sorry. sorry, can I say, um, I think one of the other difficulties is that there isn't any training for educational audiologists in Scotland there isn't any of the universities that, that provide that. I think one other further point is there isn't actually any consistency between the audiologists that do exist in Scotland. So there isn't a job description for an educational audiologist. It's quite inconsistent. So, so you have skill level. Yeah. Well, the qualification is a guarantee. Sorry, Audrey. I mean, it does obviously make sense to have a better use of... of um, technology and also to centralise services across authorities and, and make good use you know, of, of resources and not only uh, hardware and software resources but, but the people resources and it, you know, rather than seeing authorities wasting money you know, um, trying to, to provide these services on their own it, it, it does, you know, an economy of scale has to be able to be leveraged Sorry, Rachel Is that you, Colin? Yes, uh, OK, before we move on, I'm going to just take a so- short suspension at the moment for just a five-minute break, if you don't mind. Thank you.
Okay, um, we'll just uh, move on now um, uh, with uh, Chick Brodie. Thank you. Good morning. Um, in the papers that we got, there's a, a quote from the Scottish Council on Deafness uh, highlighting the importance of multi-agency information. Uh, the quote is, under the Universal Newborn Hearing Screening Programme, children are picked up in a hearing test that happens as part of health tests in the first six weeks. Now, we've heard uh, at the earlier session in terms of vision impairment that we have no uh, idea really as to, uh, there is a spectrum of course, but no idea of the actual numbers that are involved. Um, we're told that as far as uh, hearing is concerned, that screening is recorded within the NHS databases at a local level. But, but, our understanding is this information is not always shared effectively across the different services, potentially creating missed opportunities for early interventions and support for the children and families. Do you agree with that? I think that, you know, fundamentally we need to know how many uh, uh, children and we're dealing with uh, uh, for early intervention, for starting the language learning process, something crucial for a deaf baby, you know, to have access to a visual language really from as close to day one as we can get it. So it's very important. But I have, you know, other concerns about the newborn um, screening uh, test. You know, my personal experience when I had a baby myself, you know, we were given, the, because both my husband and I are deaf, we were, uh, the test was, was administered the next day. And I, I knew she was kind of hearing instinctively. I thought everything was going to be fine. And straight away, the person uh, said, oh, no, we're going to refer your baby straight away to a speech and language therapist, even though they're perfectly hearing. Which I thought, well, hang on a second. You don't know my background. You don't know who I am. I'm, I'm from a hearing family. I grew up with a hearing family myself. You know, my, my daughter, who's now 10, uh, is, is fluently bilingual, by the way, so none of those fears... Uh, she speaks just as clearly as everybody else, so I can imagine what um, their attitude's going to be like with hearing parents who have a deaf baby, the, the, the other way around. You know, because, I mean, I was upset. I mean, my daughter had just been born. It's the day after, you know, and I, I put myself into the hearing um, parents' um, position, and I think, you know, the, you know, the, the health... The health services and settings need to be, know how to work with the social side of things, having positive role models, getting deaf adults in there, not to have this negative attitude of, oh dear, your child's deaf, what, and seeing it as a necessarily negative thing. But, you know, the health services do need to be plugged in, but they also need to be uh, making parents aware of all the different life possibilities and all the different avenues that their deaf child um, can undertake and and to know that, that deaf people do regularly strive for and achieve their dreams in, in many walks of life. May, may, I ask, may I ask, in terms of that's very helpful, but um, what I suppose the most important people, people uh, that, that we've talked about, teachers are very important, uh, the curriculum is very important, the methods are very important, but at the end of the day, the parents are absolutely critical from day one. I mean, what measures would you um, support in terms of improvements in multi-agency working to support parents you know, from day one and in the early years? Rachel. Um, I'd just like to refer you to the Scottish Sensory Centre Early Years Standards, which were developed by a group of practitioners and parents in 2011. And they set out ways that the agencies can work together, seeing the parents at the centre of the team. And... And that attitude about putting the parents at the centre is quite difficult for some agencies to realise. We know we've got the benefit of newborn screening in Scotland and we've got good paediatric standards, but these standards are not statutory. Education Scotland does not assess with them at all and doesn't actually assess early years services. We know many of those early years services are very, very successful. Angus, for example, has got a very successful service. It's a small authority, but they have got age-appropriate language for all deaf children who have been or nearest to age-appropriate from the age that screening started. And as they go on more and more, what they're not getting from newborn screening is mildly deaf children. They are picked up, people who've got mild, children who've got mild deafness, but they're not referred straight away. So those sorts of things could be improved a great deal. These guidelines could be made statutory, Education Scotland, HMIE could inspect them. Um, also, if you look at the, um, the BDA recommendations about an early year's sign-intensive environment, 
that could also be very useful for establishing bilingual education for those for many deaf children because it's an advantage for everybody to have a bilingual experience and I like the way they suggested about um, having a resource space with a reasonable number of deaf children and deaf adults signing or hearing adults who can sign very fluently having a, a fluent language before you have an implant or having exposure to a fluent language before you have an implant actually helps you map those um, signs that you know onto spoken English very well deaf children from deaf families actually do best out of any group um, when they have an implant because they already have a language before so early exposure to two languages is a good thing but it's very hard to organize and I that's why I quite like the VDA's response there where they were looking in practical detail about how uh, agencies and authorities co cooperate to make that happen uh, so I think those are the two steps that I would suggest implement these make them in something which HMIE can inspect and remember the parents at the centre and uh, establish early years bilingual environments. Good. Hi, can I just say that we did have um, two pilots for um, local record um, of deaf children in both uh, Lothian and Tayside, which was set up um, on the back of universal newborn screening and, and which was all about sharing information and making sure uh, that services were working together. One of the things that, that we've called for is that we have a national rollout of that. But it, because it creates that environment where services are working together and we're using the information from universal newborn screening to make sure that um, professionals and services are working together. The other thing that um, I would say is that what's critical for parents re remembering that 90% um, of parents are hearing um, who have a deaf child uh, is the role that the third sector can play. Um, all the things that, um, that, that around about deaf role models, making sure that parents have impartial advice, um, making sure that there's someone there to navigate them through what can be a really challenging and, and difficult time. Um, GERFEC provides the perfect framework for that, um, but we need, to, we need to make sure that we're progressing in terms of those GERFEC pathways and that services are truly working together and that parents have got that very practical, impartial advice from other parents our family support service covers every authority in Scotland. Our family support workers are parents of deaf children. Um, that kind of practical um, emotional support is really, really important too. So I think there are solutions there and there are things that we know and have learned from the past that we can roll out um, to improve how services work together and how we can make sure that within that pathway parents get support from other parents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mary. Supplementary on that point, and I'm grateful to you for raising it. Um, if, uh, paragraph 5.1 in the National uh, Deaf Children's uh, Evidence, um, despite the introduction of the Universal Newborn Health Screening in 2005, the Scottish Government has not yet published any guidance in terms of post-diagnostic and subsequent early year support uh, for children and families, resulting in considerable implications for long-term education and well-being outcomes. So I hear what uh, Rachel O'Neill mentioned about uh, coming together, but why has it taken 10 years for the government to produce nothing after the introduction of this universal newborn health screening in 2005? We, we have got standards. No, but the we don't government have hasn't published. That's, That's right. what I'm talking about. Yeah. I think probably it might have been... Sorry, do you want to reply? I think it might have been because newborn screening was seen in a very health-orientated way. And there are actually paediatric standards, which are very good, but they don't involve what happens next, which is talking to a teacher, talking to language role models. It's, it, the implementation of the screening has been seen almost entirely as a health issue. It's obviously not. So when you say has not published guidance, and to, you know, I won't repeat what I've said, did you expect them to publish guidance? That's what I'm reading into it. Or does the guidance not matter? No, I think That's guidance, what I'm not understanding. I think the guidance is absolutely critical. and I think So why hasn't it been done for 10 years? I think for the reasons that Rachel's um, describing in terms of health. Sorry, Audrey. Well, I was just going to say, um, <coughs> nobody's listening to deaf people. 
perhaps is the reason? Nobody's no. listening to us. I think we are listening today. I did pick up the... It was Audrey that uh, started on that point, and to be fair, I have picked that up. <laughs> Oh, no, uh, the inference was that the government hasn't been listening I for 10 years. Yes, but, but all I'm asking, convener, is the government's guidance in terms of early year support and, and uh, information, is it critical going forward in terms of support, attainment, etc., for deaf children? Rachel? Um, I'd like to discuss this, because I think it is critical. In some local authorities in Scotland, there are... Um, not enough teachers of the deaf or not enough qualified teachers of the deaf and occasionally you well rather regularly actually you hear about children who are languageless at five or six which is far too late they are referred at birth but perhaps they might be getting i have heard examples quite recently of, of uh, somebody being aided at three and a half and they've been referred at birth nothing much had happened in the meantime. So the, the reason why we need these standards is because there is inconsistency between authorities. And some authorities have got very proactive staff, go on extra courses, read a lot, understand the early monitoring protocol which we have, which is English materials about the development of early sign and speech, and they're implementing them, they're monitoring very carefully. Other authorities say to me, I've heard one person say to me, what is the monitoring protocol? Now that is just... Shocking. I mean, those children haven't got a chance. Languageless children should not exist. But unfortunately, in, 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 in deaf world, we meet languageless children. Of course, they're not going to achieve academically. Uh, one of the problems is languageless children often exist in rural areas and they're not allowed to get to a place where they can see sign language used. Yes, Audrey. And I'd have to say quite... It's a little bit sad. I mean, I've... I've met languageless people who are, who don't live in the rural area, you know, who are in, uh, you know, yeah. urban areas, and it's and it does come back to the fact that the teachers and the support staff that they meet don't know how to sign. Their parents don't know how to sign to a significant standard. So what chance do they have, in a sense? But I wouldn't mind going back just quickly to the newborn screening um, issue. Um, there ha there has been some research from Leeds. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the researcher about the emotional uh, at emotional attachment with baby. And because of the attitude of health professionals um, on, uh, at the point of diagnosis, um, it doesn't allow um, either the mother or the father uh, to really effectively bond with their child and, and celebrate, you know. I mean, everybody's always after the perfect healthy baby, is what we're told. Um, but, and the screening obviously has an advantage because it picks these things up early. But what it does, of course, is it can run the risk of the parents detaching from the child starting to feel guilty um, immediately about that. Um, and no matter what we uh, think, babies pick up on that. They pick up on that quite clearly. So we should be straight away providing a positive environment for those parents saying, look, you know, here's a, here's a language that you can access, that your child can access straight away. You know, and before um, the newborn screening uh, program, ironically, parents had that time to bond with their child. My parents didn't know that I was deaf until I was nine months old. Um, but that bond and the love had already been established. That affirmation uh, for me as a human being had already been made. I wasn't seen as deficient or disabled immediately. So a lot more has got to be done in that area um, uh, to give parents this positive experience rather than, a, oh dear, your child's deaf and everything's negative. Yeah, and, and, and to see it as something that necessarily needs to be repaired. Thank you. Mary, do you want to move on to...? Yes, only one question. That's fine, OK. My questions were actually on uh, data collection and uh, attainment, but uh, uh, so I'll, I'll just go to, to one question, and uh, that is um, our briefing from the Parliament today looks at positive destinations uh, for school leavers with a hearing impairment. So if I look at those with uh, no additional support needs, it's 91.7, and with a hearing impairment, 89.4, which on paper doesn't look too bad. If I just go to further education, with uh, no additional support needs, the follow-up destination is 22.5, and with a hearing impairment, 41. Now, as an economist, I know that below these figures there are many stories to tell, but if you'll forgive me, taking a, 
a rough glance at these figures, they look quite good. Um, I find it hard to believe that that's the full story, and I would perhaps ask you if, if, if uh, positive destinations, entry into further education, I have to say higher education is uh, about half uh, for people with a hearing impairment, impairment. But, you know, behind these figures, these figures look quite good. Behind the figures, are there any concerns you would like to raise with us today? Uh, well, yes, I think you're right to pick out about the difference between further education and higher education. A larger proportion of children go, deaf children go on to further education rather than higher. It's pr 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 practically reversed. Uh, which the reason is because of the largely because of the English level, and the research that we've done recently at the University of Edinburgh, the achievements of um, the Nuffield Foundation. Uh, funded research about the achievements of deaf pupils in Scotland showed that there were two areas of concern and I, I showed them in the uh, graph that I put in my submission which was um, the English results at S4 actually no you can't see this but S4 um, S4 you, you've got all the levels of deafness category from people with cochlear implants to mildly deaf, profoundly deaf, severely deaf, deaf, performing much worse at S4 in English. And then when you get the high flyers, those who you'd expect to be going to university, um, getting level five when they're in S4, um, again, drastically different results. I mean, all the different categories of deafness performing much worse. Now, this is because, it must be because of early language experience and also the experience they have right the way through school in support and access to language in the curriculum. So, um, data collection is very important. The other group that I would want to concentrate on is those who leave school with very low-level qualifications or no level, no qualifications, which about, is about 16%, and much, much higher with, with a level three SEQF qualification, you really can't get onto a very decent college course. So that group of children need much more examination. Who are they? And I expect that many of them are from impoverished backgrounds, which we unfortunately have come to expect in the UK. And many of them would also be probably the languageless children that I talked about before. And many of them perhaps have been unfortunate enough to grow up in areas where they didn't have access to sign language and were profoundly deaf or they didn't have very good acoustic conditions. So th that group of children who achieve poorly, getting SCQF level three and below when they leave school, need more study. And we need to find out who they are and we need to put targets in, not when they're 16, that's far too late. We need the early years environment. And I would say mildly deaf children, as much as profoundly deaf children, need that support early on. I, I am concerned in Scotland at the moment about the speech and language therapy cuts which seem to be very widespread. And I think that the whole range of deaf children in the early years needs extra support, much better support from multi-agency groups. Thank you. Audrey? I think just to add to what Rachel was saying about the... the there is a need for um, support, but there is also a desperate need for research about what's actually going on in the classroom. When we have got successful learners, why are they successful? What's going on with them? You know, we talk about not enough communication support workers, not enough teachers of the deaf, not enough qualified people there. That's fine, but we do need to find out what's going on in the classrooms today, what the reality is in, you know, because what I suspect we're often finding is mainstream uh, teachers with one deaf child in their class and perhaps having a teacher of the deaf or a communication support worker, a CSW, coming in for um, a certain amount of time a week and running what is essentially a macro class within the larger class. So the classroom teacher isn't directly teaching the deaf child. They're, they're devolving that responsibility to someone else who may not be qualified to deliver that education. You know, and put it, I mean, I've seen this in evidence myself. You know, th there's no way you can expect a child to behave normally in that situation. Of course, they're going to be disruptive. They're going to be distracted. They're going to look out the window. They're not going to be paying attention because they're detached from the rest of the class. Um, and they're existing within this macro environment. So there's no follow-up from the teacher directly. Um, and they're not enjoying uh, anywhere near uh, the level of access education that all the other uh, kids are. So this inclusive education is actually exclusive. Uh, 
and I've been following four deaf children to try and uh, ask them why they don't get involved in asking the teacher questions. Um, that interactive part of, of, of someone's education experience is one of the most crucial uh, parts of their learning. Um, and we've identified that often the, the classroom teachers, um, when they ask a question to the class, um, you know, as we've seen on the panel today, you know, hearing people can put up their hands a lot faster. You know, and it's actually 1.2 seconds is all you've got on average before the first kid's hand goes up. So when you've got a communication support worker who isn't qualified, um, how are they supposed to keep the deaf child up to speed or a teacher of the deaf even? You know, I've seen teachers of the deaf, I've seen one of them saying, oh, don't worry about it, I'll write it down for you later, I'll tell you later. So that's not, they don't stand a chance and therefore the, ch the children don't stand a chance. And that's why they're not getting anything out of this supposedly inclusive what would be better is if we had uh, children in, 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 in smaller group environments interacting directly with a teacher that was qualified and skilled in the necessary language and cultural aspects to deal with them, not education through a third party. So that deaf children are involved in class discussions, involved in debates, they know what's going on in the whole classroom and they're not feeling isolated as they currently are. You know, we're, we, we talk about a holistic education experience uh, and, and life skills and habilitation skills, but we're, we're falling woefully short on all of those uh, uh, measure, measurements when it comes to deaf children. And the first step uh, to improving that is to have a look at what's actually going on in the classrooms today. And we don't have an idea. We don't have a picture of that yet. It wouldn't be acceptable. I mean, would you take it if it was your child? Would you accept that education for your child? You know, a lot of the communication support workers that are providing the, the access, they don't have subject knowledge um, um, and they don't have fundamentally and crucially the language skills to perform their job. So, I mean, how could you try, how can you interpret physics if you can barely sign? We need to look at what's going on in the classrooms today. Thank you. Good. Can I just say this is one of the reasons why um, NDCS have been uh, calling on an aspect review um, of deaf education um, because what we've seen and what has come through um, our research um, are pockets of excellent practice where this is done exceptionally well in Scotland and other areas where it's incredibly poor. But because peripatetic teachers of the deaf who largely the teachers supporting young people in the mainstream are not routinely inspected, we do not have a national picture um, of the quality uh, of support that's going in. And we have repeatedly, and I'll repeat it again today, um, said we believe very strongly that what we now need is a full aspect review of deaf education so that we can identify where practice is really good and really learn from it and share that best practice and really get to grips with where it is just not working well. Okay, thank you. Um, Siobhan McMahon. Thank you. Um, I want to go on and talk about the um, independence of, of people who are at school and, and how we get that and I had asked some questions about the habilitation skills um, in the first panel which I will do but I wanted to start um, with Dr Cameron's evidence because um, Dr Cameron you finished with the sentence uh, in, in the last paragraph what we need is a system for gathering data on the achievements of deaf pupils I was wondering what that system would look like and also what do you believe the achievements would be I, well, I feel that the the achievements, you know, um, would, in Scotland would be woefully bad and inadequate. I think that's what the picture would be. I had to go to England myself to get a decent education, so I had to travel from Scotland and I had to go down there. But but what, when you talk about that system, what we need to do is is uh, take in the whole picture, not just the child's understanding of a subject. Yeah, um, you, you, you know, you talk about confidence, uh, habilitation skills, independent skills all that stuff that we see in the curriculum for excellence, it's simply not happening for deaf children. Um, we do have some isolated individual success stories, but it's, it's, no, it's by no means um, uh, predictive. Um, and often what we see is in that situation that there's been extra payments made either by the family or the school or somewhere to get extra communication support for that child. So it comes down to money. 
So, I mean, I, I mean, if it was a hearing child not receiving the same standard of education as their peers, I, I mean, we, we would have parents, parents would be outraged. But we seem to find it acceptable for deaf children. Um, and and that, I think that's the, 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 the nub of the question. So, uh, I think then it comes on to my next question then about um, to what extent um, habilitation skills are being provided across the country. Do we know that? Or um, has anyone got an idea of who's, who's doing more? If it's in mainstream schools, if it's in independent schools, if it's in um, special schools, have we got any idea across the country as to what's happening? Shall I answer that one? Yes. Um, I suppose in, in my job, I'm lucky that I am able to visit a lot of schools and also do placement visits and um, read placement files. So in some way, I have got an idea. I'm not saying it's a complete picture. Uh, there are many really good things happening in um, supporting. We don't usually use the term habilitation in deaf education, but I know what you mean. In visual impairment terms, it's things like mobility training and things like that. In terms of deaf education... It, well, I suppose independence and resilience and confidence. Okay. And I think, I mean, I think the NDCS has done some very good work in this area. And the, when I look at s children who are coming to events, for example, which sometimes have events at the Scottish Sensory Centre for Pupils, the, the places where there is a resource-based school, I, saw, I see much more confidence. And I see in some areas of, the, of Scotland, deaf studies being a, a subject in itself. And I don't mean just big D deaf studies, only focusing on sign language, but talking about the experience of being deaf and having the chance to reflect on that experience and seeing yourself as a potential deaf adult who is likely to perhaps sometimes want to use sign, sometimes want to use speech in different circumstances, understanding the situation of deaf people and understanding what they need to do to make hearing people work better with them. That sort of self-confidence assertiveness training is done some, in some places and you can see the results when you get groups of deaf children together. I must say that Falkirk is one of those places where I've seen deaf students being very confident and talk out and, and be aware about who they are. And you've got deaf adults in that school, haven't you? So I think the proof is in the pudding there. I think that, 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 that helps a great deal, you know, because a lot of deaf children, I mean, amazingly think that they're going to become hearing when they grow up. They still walk around with that fallacy because they never meet a deaf adult throughout their whole childhood. Have, we have a deaf sign language tutor, but we often have um, lots of our uh, former pupils coming back and talking to the children and being involved with what they're doing. Any time we have a deaf adult in the school, we always invite them down right to the, the primary classes to make sure that they are aware. We do surveys on um, with the children, the very young pr primary children, asking, um, are you deaf or are you hearing? What do you think that person is? Are they deaf? Are they hearing? How do they communicate? Do they wear hearing aids? Um, and so on. So it, it is, it's a much more natural environment. And the children that come back um, praise the education that they've had in Windsor Park because we do care very much about each individual child's needs and try and address those needs as best we can. Yes, sorry. So, I mean, what we're seeing here is a, a clear need for an environment where, uh, you know, a deaf-friendly environment, a signing environment, not an environment that isolates the child. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Liam MacArthur. Thank you. Very much. I was interested, uh, Dr. Cameron, you made a comment that echoed, I think, what Dominic Everett said in the previous panel about the scope within Curriculum for Excellence to, to address some of these things. Uh, his concern was then that there wasn't kind of space and capacity within the system to allow some of the habilitation to take place. I wonder if similar issues arise in relation to the, the independence and resilience that you were talking about, uh, Rachel. And, and therefore, as we got onto a discussion about whether or not the presumption of mainstreaming was actually the way in which it was implemented and interpreted was actually working against the, the interests of, in, in, in the previous discussion, those with um, sight impairments and whether this, there's a similar issue in relation to those with hearing impairment. 
I, I think it would say that you'd say that mainstreaming isn't working at all in that regard. Now, you can see why wanting to include deaf people in society sounds like a great thing. It doesn't sound like a bad thing at all in theory. But the actual experience is that they're becoming more isolated. They're more vulnerable in the mainstream than they ever have been before. And you know, teachers of the deaf might be able to visit, what, once a week? In some cases, once a month, you know, an hour a day. So what are the kids doing the rest of the time in school? What's happening all the other hours? If you've got a deaf resource center or a base within a larger school where you've got that critical mass to enable confidence, independence, um, I think that we can get through all of the curriculum for excellence. It, in the, there shouldn't be any barriers to learning if we provide the right learning environment. Deaf kids... You know, I've met deaf people who know a number of languages. There's no reason deaf people can't even learn French, Japanese, physics, any subject. Um, if the language base is there, if the education is accessible, then they can achieve on a par with their hearing peers. But to drop them in the mainstream um, with no support or, or inadequate support is... is you know, it, well, it's, it's, sh it's shameful, and, and one, one doesn't like to think about the mental health implications that must arise from uh, the anxiety these young people must feel going through that experience. And deafness is not a learning disability, that's, and, and that's an important point to bear in mind. I, I, mean, I was going to say that the visit to Winter Park School was, was evidence that where it works, it can work extremely well. And therefore, um, I suppose the question is... Um, does that give us confidence that we should be able to make that work across the piece, perhaps by concentrating resource um, in, in, in some respects? Um, or will we need to tailor things in an urban setting compared to a rural setting? I mean, I, I, I had a previous panel talk about the, the, the lack of provision at all in my own constituency in Orkney, and that comes as no surprise to me. Um, recruitment can present uh, real difficulties in some in some rural areas. So is, is there a danger that we try to fix this with a, a sort of one-size-fits-all and, and, and end up coming up with, with solutions that really aren't going to work in, in different parts of the country? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that question. I caught it on the monitor downstairs, actually, as you were asking it to the previous panel. And I think the standards in Scotland's Schools Act leading to the presumption of mainstreaming does some deaf children a real disservice because of the fact that they can risk falling into this category of languageless. And also, as Audrey has explained very clearly about mental health implications of being different, isolated and not involved in the classroom. So uh, the research that we did suggested that it would benefit local authorities if they cooperated and set up resource-based schools where you have a peer group. Um, and this can work for children who sign as well as who, children who use speech. I mean, DL High School is a very good example of a successful resource-based school where children achieve. And if you notice, DL is in the top 50 secondary schools for Scotland, according to the Herald's League table, and it's got more than you'd expect children from deprived backgrounds, and the, the success rate is good. Um, having a, a mass of children... I mean, I don't necessarily think that it's good that DL only uses speech because I can't see nowadays why we need to just have that approach. But the fact is, it's an achieving school. It's a school where parents want their children to go. They're very happy when the deaf, um, parents of deaf children are very happy when the children get into DL. They achieve well. And resource-based schools are a good idea. Obviously, easier to work out in um, Central Belt than in the rest of Scotland. But rural authorities could collaborate and did in the past collaborate. For example, Aberdeenshire used to send children into Aberdeen City to the, where they have a school. They don't anymore. That's where you have a risk, I think, and it's perfectly possible for those local authorities to collaborate more. And we have to consider as part of that boarding, you know, boarding schools. We do have, you know, uh, children still do go to a school. Mary Hare, notably in England, is a school that they go to very successfully. They're, they're usually weekend boarders, so they go home at the weekend. But I know, I mean, some people find it very heartbreaking, you know, in today's context, you know, and, and uh, you know, to being away from your parents. But I'm actually very grateful to my parents for taking that brave step and providing me with the education that I required. And if they hadn't have done that at the time and hadn't made that move, I certainly wouldn't have got my doctorate and I wouldn't be sitting here in front of you. 
perhaps the Harry Potter books have made boarding more attractive uh, to, to 21st century parents. I don't know, but... Um, That's what my experience was like, yeah. Being <laughs> <laughs> That's what my school was like, being yes. at Hogwarts. Yeah, <laughs> except we were all deaf. <laughs> but still magical. Can I, um, can I thank the panel um, for coming along this morning um, and giving up your time to come and uh, speak to us and give us your evidence? Um, it's been very helpful. This is obviously the start of a, a short inquiry into um, sensory impairment to go along with the bigger inquiry on attainment that we're doing um, and also I think fits very well in some, into some of the work we've done with Mark Griffin's bill on uh, BSL. So I think, uh, once again, can I thank you very much and can I also uh, just thank Andy Carmichael very much for all his efforts, though mm -hmm. it's uh, um, it's through him that we'd, obviously we can we can do this so well. So thanks very much, Andy, and, I, and thank you. <laughs> okay, we um, uh, we'll have to suspend now uh, to allow witnesses to leave. We move on to uh, uh, agenda item three. Um, on the 27th of January 2015, the Public Petitions Committee referred petition PE1530 uh, by Spencer Files on behalf of the Scottish Secular Society to this committee. Um, just um, so everybody's aware, the petition stated that it wished to see the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to issue official guidance to bar the presentation in Scottish publicly funded schools of separate creation and of young earth doctrines as viable alternatives to the established science of evolution, common descent and deep time. Uh, we considered the petition at our meeting on the 10th of March and agreed to write to the Minister for Learning, Science and Scotland's Languages with a number of questions. Uh, we have now received a response from the Minister and that's attached to the papers uh, that you, committee members will have received. Um, can I invite the committee to consider what further action, if any, it wishes to take in relation to the petition um, or any comments you want to make? Check. Close the petition. OK. Any comments from other members? Liam? Yeah, I think we, we posed three questions. The, the, the questions have been um, addressed. I'm, uh, I note in particular the, the comment in relation to having a, a non-statutory curriculum and, and, and the risks of going down a route that may see us um, starting to undermine that. Uh, I think the assurances we were looking for are, are in the letter, so I'd be minded uh, as we check to, to close the petition on that basis. Mary? Well, uniquely, I agree with the government. <laughs> uh, I think that the main point is that it is preferable to leave the curriculum to teachers enable them to exercise their professional judgment in what is taught rather than legislate to ban issues in schools. And that, to me, says it all. Uh, um, so I, um, I think I'm on the same page as others who've spoken. Okay. Any other comments stage? Mark? I think the, the Minister has answered the, the concern as to how um, the prevalence of the issue. I think I'm reassured that... Um, it hasn't been an issue in schools and in teaching of 
science lessons and I think I would ag agree with what seems to be the consensus that we should close the petition. Okay, certainly from my, my own point of view, um, one of the concerns I certainly raised at the time was particularly in, in reference to the, the possible intrusion of creationism into science classes. I think that was the particular, not other possible, not, the, not banning the possibility of discussion of such philosophies and ideas within the school, but particularly within science classes. And I think it's very helpful of the minister who's, who's written to us, who said that, and I'll just quote from the letter, um, so it's on the official report, uh, guidance provided by Education Scotland set out in the principles and practice papers and the experiences and outcomes documentation for each of the eight curriculum areas does not identify creationism as a, as a scientific principle. It should therefore not be taught as part of science lessons. I think that couldn't be clearer um, from the government. So I, I'm, I'm in accord, I think, with other members in the committee that, um, that we should now uh, close the petition uh, in light of the, the uh, letter we've now received from the government. Would members agree that we will write to the petitioner in form of the decision and also enclose a copy of the letter we've received from the Minister? Is that agreeable? Yes. Agreed. OK, we'll close the petition. Thank you very much. Um, as the committee has agreed to hold the next items in private, I now close the meeting to the public. <laughs>